what does Elvis, Bob Dylan, the Beatles, Frank Sinatra, and Anne Margaret all have in common? Well, of course, Mickey Jones. I was raised in a little town called Grand Prairie. Now, Grand Prairie is between Dallas and Fort Worth. But when I lived there, it was just a little town in the country. Today, it's sucked up in that whole Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex, but it was where I learned music from my mom and dad. Thank God for my mom and dad, because my mom and dad gave me the gift of music. So I will always be grateful to my mom and dad. You know, that actually was a, a hotbed of music around that Dallas area and in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, there was a lot of music coming out of there. Well, I think, Jerry, if you think about it, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, that's where really all the great musicians came from. I was fortunate that when I was 16 years old, I was playing drums for an old blues player named Jimmy Reed. And I remember going and playing these SMU fraternity parties, and I'd get $10 for playing all night long and feel guilty about taking the money because I loved it so much. Well, that could be the end of most people's story to just be able to say they played with Jimmy Reed. That's, I mean, that's a, good, a good lick, though. What were some of the early bands that you played in? I was about 15 when I started. I realized I wanted to play drums. And the thing that made me think about being a drummer is when I would listen to a record or I'd be listening to the radio, the drums are what I heard. And my mom, along with me saving up, I bought a little set of drums for $146. I remember it like yesterday. Had them in my room, in my bedroom, playing with records. So I never learned to read music. Like anything, when, when we start out, it's, it's a learning curve beyond belief. But you're talking about a feel, and it, actually I think that's probably the legacy of that whole area, is that all that music is based on feel. You can have all the chops and all the skills and talents you want. Jimmy Reed, he probably couldn't make four chords. Made three. He made three. And but the thing about playing feel. with Jimmy Reed, it's funny you bring that up again, Jimmy Reed wanted you to play dead straight ahead. And if you threw in, but I don't, he'd, he'd turn and look, what was that? So I learned to play straight ahead, dead steady. And I think that served me well through my, my musical career. Hell of a beginning and, and intro into feel and blues and music. Yeah. Then after that, tell me a little bit about the Catalinas. Wow, you're one of the three people that know about the Catalinas, and two of them are still in Dallas. Uh, the Catalinas was a group that I played with in high school. We had a big hit record all over Texas called Speechless. The thing about the Catalinas, it was fun. I felt like I was part of something. And then uh, I think it was my junior year of high school, we used to rehearse right across the street from our high school. And this lady named Adreen Bailey, she was our quote manager, really because she let us rehearse in her house. And I remember going in one afternoon, getting ready to rehearse after school, and I went back to the, the, the room, all our equipment was set up, and my drums had been moved, and I couldn't find my drums, and I, they were in another room, and I, I said, well, guys, why are my drums in here? They said, oh, we have a new drummer. We do? Yeah, he's 18. And that was the reason they had a new drummer, I was 16, he was 18, well certainly he had the world skills behind him, so uh, I was relieved of being the drummer for the Catalinas and it was probably one of the most devastating things that ever happened to me. I remember going out and sitting on the front step of Adrienne Bailey's house and I cried like a two-year-old because it absolutely broke my heart. Yeah. But fortunately, I was, I was employed pretty quick right after that. Gene Vincent. I worked with Gene Vincent at the Yellow Belly Drag Strip in 
Grand Prairie of all places. I did several gigs with Gene Vincent and Gene Vincent was a real rocker. His first big hit was Bebop Alula and then a lot of loving. And uh, although I did not play on those records, I did play with Gene Vincent and that's another learning experience. Well now if you'd have just said Jimmy Reed and Gene Vincent, your story would have been great. Actually, you mentioned your mom and dad, and what did your dad do for a living? My dad was a 23-year Navy pilot, and my dad was my hero. My dad flew a PBY Catalina during World War II, and his job was to go out on a, into a grid on a map out of New Guinea and Borneo and be on station in case a fighter pilot went down he would pick that pilot up in the middle of the ocean. My dad told me all the three years he was in the South Pacific, he never had to buy a drink. <laughs> He'd go to the officer's club and they'd say, oh yeah, you picked up so-and-so, come on over here. So, so I really look at my dad as, as my hero. Yeah, and your mom too. Oh, my mom, was, yeah. my mom was too dang cool. My mom and dad met at a dance and they danced for 63 years. They're a very important part of certainly the beginning of your story. Friday and Saturday night, I don't care what was on the schedule, it was that they were going dancing. Yeah, and who did they meet? Well, they, they used to follow a kid in Dallas, a group called Trini Lopez and the Big Beats. And so uh, my mom said something to Trini one day. Trini was about to leave the Big Beats because the Big Beats were more, they wanted to be an instrumental group, not a singer. So they were gonna get rid of Trini. So Trini ended up out on his own. And uh, my mom said to Trini one night, if you ever need a drummer, uh, give us a call because our son's a drummer. Sure enough, the phone rang. A couple weeks later, my, my mom said, yeah, no, yeah, he can go, yeah. So uh, she said, Trini Lopez is on the phone and they want, you to play with them at Jimmy's Club tonight in Dallas. What had happened is his drummer, a kid named Juvi Gomez, had a car wreck. And he was not seriously injured, but he had a couple of weeks he wasn't going to be able to play. So he's going to hire me for a couple of weeks. And I was with uh, Trini for eight years. <laughs> and so that was, that was a real turning point in my life. Because in 1959, Buddy Holly got killed. And Trini then drove from Dallas to Lubbock to take Buddy Holly's place with the crickets. Yeah. And when he got to Lubbock, Jerry Allison, J.I., the drummer, had broken his arm. And his arm was in a cast. And he wasn't going to be able to play for like six weeks. So Trini said, well, I can't really sit around Lubbock for six weeks. I'm supporting my family. I have to get a job. So Trini drove to L.A., got a job at a little place called the Ye Little Club in Beverly Hills. Well, shortly after that, I got a letter from the Texas Department of Public Safety, which is like the Highway Patrol, saying that I had too many tickets and that on my birthday, June 10th, my license in Texas would no longer be valid. So I, before my birthday, drove to LA. I applied for a California driver's license and they said on the thing, have you ever had your driver's license revoked? And I went, well, it's not June 10th yet. I said, no. <laughs> and then I moved to LA and moved in with Trini. And I got a job working as a page at NBC. Trini got this job at a little club called PJ's. He said, I want you to work at PJ's. So I was working weekends and I was making more money on the weekend at PJ's than I was all week long at NBC. So I started working six nights a week with Trini at PJ's, and then when we recorded the first album, Trini Lopez Live at PJ's, his career exploded. Tonight from New York, The Ed Sullivan Show. Now, in introducing Trini Lopez, when Trini asked you to sing along with him, I want you to join right in because he'll enjoy your choral work, and he, you'll get a great kick out of it. So ladies and gentlemen, here is the newest recording star, Trini Lopez.
So does it, does it feel like yesterday? Yeah, kind of fun to look at that. Now you guys are playing PJs as a duo, just drums and Trini on guitar. Right. And doing what you guys do. Well, something happened because it really ignited there. And that first record was just the two of you and it went over the moon. I don't know how many copies it sold, but it just kept selling. Well, it was in the millions. I know that uh, our manager, Bullets Durgum was his name, was Trini's manager. And he had two brothers, Buckshot and BB. <laughs> And that's not a joke, of that's course. for real. But uh, Bullets came in one night and he says, be in my office at 10 o'clock in the morning, we gotta get you passports, because Thursday you're going to Holland. And I'm this kid from Texas who'd never been anywhere. And I'm going to Holland. We went back later to England on a package show. It was called a GAC, General Artist Corporation package show. And the artists were Brooke Benton, Timmy Euro, Leslie Gore, Dion, and Trini. We flew into Heathrow Airport. We had two Rolls Royces pick us up, took us to Vic Lewis's office, who was the promoter on the concert tour, because we're on a tour all over Britain. And uh, he said, guys, we have a, a bit of a small problem. The American acts are coming over and taking all the jobs away from our British groups. So the federal government in England is making us, well, I guess requiring us to hire at least one British group to be on the show, maybe open the show. So we hired this little group called the Rolling Stones to open for us. And I thought they were okay, you know, they, they could play a little blues, but nothing to write home about. I mean, they don't really have a big career ahead of them. <laughs> so we toured all over France. We did uh, eight weeks at the Olympia Theater in Paris. We're working Fréjus, Marseille, we're working all the, we did a concert at the casino in Monte Carlo and it was a command performance, and Princess Grace and Prince Rainier were there. They asked to come back and meet us after the show. So after the show, we're kind of in a line there to meet Princess Grace and Prince Rainier. Princess Grace, she says to Trini, I'd like you and your boys to come up to the palace for breakfast this morning. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so they sent a Cadillac limousine to pick us up at our hotel. This limo takes us up to the palace, go through the gates at the palace, and we're in there having breakfast with Princess Grace and Prince Rainier. And I'm sitting actually next to Princess Grace, and she is good looking. Do you think she felt the same way about you? I'm pretty sure she did. But Princess Grace said, you know, we love your music. The kids run around the palace dancing to your records. And I said, I've never heard it put quite like that before. <laughs> that was a real highlight to get to meet Princess Grace. I was pretty jazzed. You mentioned the Olympia Theater. Yeah, we did eight weeks at the Olympia Theater. And the Olympia Theater is an old school theater. I mean, it's, it's the place to play in Paris. We had a little group open for us called the Beatles. And they were, uh, they were the coolest guys, man. We got to hang out with them every day, every night. Uh, I could tell you stories, we'd run out of time. But getting to meet the Beatles and hang out with the Beatles was very, very cool. This is my old eight millimeter home movie camera. And uh, I, I just walked up in the balcony one night and did this shoot of them. And then I did a little bit from the side of the stage. I actually licensed this footage in two documentaries about the Beatles. One is called Rare and Unseen. The other one uh, is in Australia. I just licensed it. One, I got $12,000 for three minutes. And then the other, I got $16,000 for three minutes. That picture was to actually taken for them. I walked in the artist's entrance. 
Ringo stuck his head out. And he said, Mickey, you got a minute? And I went, well, yeah. And I walked over and he said, could we take a picture with you? I said, well, sure. So I walked in their dressing room and gathered around. And a guy named Ian McMillan took that photo. I don't know why I remember these names. So they shot that photo for them. We're doing that photo and just goofing off. They said, hey, would you sign a picture to each one of us? So I said, well, sure. So I go get a picture and I'm signing a picture to Ringo, okay, okay, to John. And about the time I finished, they gave me a picture that they had all signed to me. And I sold that picture on eBay. <laughs> Well, I, I kept it on my desk for 35 years with dog-eared corners and everything. I never framed it, I never did anything with it, but before I sold it on eBay, I scanned it so I could make a couple of really good copies, and I have a copy of it now framed uh, on my wall, and I sold it for almost $8,000. And that was before George passed away, so yeah. imagine what it's worth now. Yeah. This is kind of the beginning of your cinematography career <laughs> because you had this eight millimeter home, home movie camera that you were carrying around and filming everything. This wasn't like you guys did one or two shows and you met them and it was really nice. You guys were together for two months or two, two months. Two months every day. Every day. Which means sometimes. Well, we had, we had one day off. We were off on Monday. And I would fly with John Lennon Sunday night back to London and I would stay the weekend with him and his wife, Cynthia. And he took me to a, a, a boot maker called Anello and David in Charing Cross Road. And they were the Beetle boots. So I would go in, every time I'd go to London, I'd go over there and I'd have these custom boots made. They'd draw a picture of your foot and it, I mean, they were perfect. And I'd get them in blue suede and black suede. And, and you know how much those boots were? Custom made boots up to here, zipper up the middle, $17 for custom made boots. And They're probably sold, a little more today. And he sold those for 8000 too, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. My favorite Beatles story. The tour is over and they've got news for you. They're going to America. We had closed the show and we're both going our separate ways. We went to Holland and, uh, and the boys were going to back to repack in London and then they were going to New York to do the Ed Sullivan Show. And at dinner, I remember John Lennon saying, you know, we're doing this, some little show, the Ed Sullivan Show. I said, well, you know, that's a good show to do. He said, yeah, but you don't understand. We want to do a show where we'd be seen in California. You got to realize, New York is about the size of Great Britain. I mean, they, that's all they had to relate to. And I said, oh, no, you'll be seen in California. Just network all over the United States, you'll be seen in California. So they go to New York. We're in Holland. And the only English speaking radio I can get is the, uh, Radio Luxembourg. So I'm laying in bed, it's about three o'clock in the morning, I got Radio Luxembourg on, and they break in on the news with all this crowd. <sighs> and I went, oh my God, who got assassinated? because we had a little period there and the announcer came on and said, well, that's the scene here at Idlewild Airport as the Beatles landed in New York City. I'm going, what? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And they did, they took this country by a storm. I'm, I'm kind of glad I was in there on the ground floor and got to be friends with these guys, not just acquaintances. They were great guys, They're just the best. Trini Lopez was signed to Reprise Records. Exactly. Which was owned by? Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Yeah. And then you guys played the Calneva Lodge. Right. Which was owned by? Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. He loved Trini so much that when we'd be playing in the lounge at the Calneva, Sinatra would come in and watch our show. I'm walking from the casino back over to the lounge where we're playing alternating sets with Buddy Rich. And, uh, Sinatra's at the crap table, he said, Mickey, he motioned me, I, went, I walked over and I said, yes, sir, Mr. Sinatra. I always called him sir, and I always called him mister. And he walked up to me and he said, 
You know, I want to tell you something. I said, yes, sir. He said, you always say sir, and you always say mister, and that's a trait that I admire more than anything else. I said, well, I'm a product of my parents. He said, you give your parents a hug from me and tell them, good job. When my mom and dad came up, my mom and dad sat ringside to see Sinatra, and there would always be a bottle of champagne from Mr. Sinatra. And that's the kind of guy he was. Sinatra flew Trini and me in his helicopter from Burbank Airport to his house in Palm Springs, landed in his backyard about 30 feet from his back door, and he gave us a tour of the house, showed us the bedroom that he had built for John Fitzgerald Kennedy, had a red, white, and blue telephone. You pick up the receiver, and it rings the White House. So uh, he was pretty connected. At the Calneva Lodge, Skinny D'Amato was the, the casino manager. And he would always say to us, hey, you come to the 500 Club, you come to Atlantic City, you come see me. And they sounded like that, too. And uh, so sure enough, we're in Atlantic City doing a big concert at the Steel Pier. And I said to Trini, I said, maybe we should call Skinny just to say hello and let him know we're here. So we called him. He said, you come to the 500 Club tonight. Which is where Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis met. Right. And it's just like in Goodfellow. We get to the door, and Ed Pucci, Sinatra's bodyguard, meets us. They get a table, take it right down front, put it right in front. We have <laughs> steak dinners, watch the show. Everything's great. We get ready to leave. We said to Ed Pucci, we'd like to see Skinny and say thank you for a wonderful dinner and a wonderful evening. It was great. We loved it. He said, follow me. So he takes us back through the bowels of the place, through the kitchen, and then into an enclosed, like a driveway, a garage. And he said, yeah, in the 40s, 50s, this is where we hit a bank, we just pull in here, the cops never find it. <laughs> hey. So we go into this little room where Skinny D'Amato's playing cards with two other guys. And he's got his green visor on and the little green shade right down over the table. And the other two guys he introduces as Uncle Marshall Cofano and Uncle Manny Scar. And uh, Marshall Cofano sitting there, and he's got a shoulder holster over his chair with a 45. And over in the corner, there's a Thompson and some shotguns and all this stuff. And on this whole wall is a portrait of Sinatra. <laughs> so I think he was connected. I'm not sure, but I'm just spitballing here. Yeah. <laughs> so this is eight years later, and your run comes to an end with Trini. I was ready for it to come to an end because Trini, God bless him, and, and nobody was more happy than me for his success, but my paycheck never changed. Every time we'd go back to PJ's, this young kid would come over and whisper in my ear because my drums were here and the crowd was right here. He'd come whisper in my ear and he kept saying, when are you going to go to work for me? And I kept saying, well, when you get enough money, give me a call. Because that's what musicians do. How much is this thing going to pay? <laughs> the last trip to Europe I made with Trini, I had already made it in my mind this was it. I wanted to get off the road with Trini. And when I got back to LA, I called this kid up. He said, I just want you to know I got enough money. And his name was John Ramastella, which is Johnny Rivers. <laughs> so I started. Uh, work with Johnny Rivers. In fact, the last night with Trini, Trini told me, he said, uh, he had made tuxedos for us. And, he, and we're supposed to give them back it, when, if we leave. So I, I was getting ready to give him his tuxedo back. He said, no, 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 you keep it. That's a gift from me. Just about worn it out here. <laughs> he said, but I want you to know this is a big mistake on your part because I am a million dollar property. And I said, Trini, I'm proud of you. I'm happy for you, but it's never going to affect me. So it's time for me to go. So I went to work with Johnny Rivers. He started me out at $500 a week. And I got to tell you, in 1964, that was not chicken feed. So what were you making with Trini? $350. $350 a week. Yeah. And you moved to $500 with Johnny. Moved Rivers. $500 with Johnny. Oh, you better not gamble, boy. 
You gotta remember, it was Johnny Rivers, Joe Osborne on bass, and I was on drums. There were only three people there, and he never played with more than three people. Yeah, he toured and worked as a trio. Well, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story. We worked uh, the Whiskey A Go Go forever, and we'd go out and travel, and we'd come back and work the whiskey. We're in England, and Lou Adler is our producer, and a guy comes up to Lou and said, look, I'm the producer of a TV series here in London called Danger Man, and we're going into America, but they changed the name to Secret Agent Man, and we'd like Johnny Rivers to sing the theme song. And Lou said, well, do you have a tape or anything? We can hear it. He said, oh, there's no song written, but we want Johnny Rivers to sing it. Well, they had a title. What else did they need? They had a title. That was it. So we, we got back to England, and Lou had a couple of writers writing for his publishing company called uh, Phil Sloan and Steve Barry, P.F. Sloan and Steve Barry. And they really made their name because they had written a song for Barry McGuire called Eve of Destruction. So Lou calls Phil and Steve in, we gotta write this song, Secret Agent Man. So they did, they wrote the song. It's 30 seconds long. And so the radio stations, literally all over the country, started playing it. And they kept calling the, the record label. When is this song coming out? Lou said, well, it's only a 30 second song. It's to a TV show. There's no whole song there. And they said, well, you better think about it. <laughs> so he got Phil and Steve on the hook again. We need to finish this song. <laughs> so we, uh, we finished it, they finished it. We recorded it live at the Whiskey A Go Go. Lou did not like the mix. He, he, he couldn't get the crowd down far enough in the mix. So he said, we need to go in the studio and cut this. So after we've been working all night at the Whiskey, about three o'clock in the morning, we go at the Western, Studio Three at Western down on Sunset, and we record uh, Secret Agent Man. Now, we didn't know that Lou had invited about 100 people in the other studio and had two coolers full of beer and sandwiches and everything. And uh, they, he would bring them in about 20 at a time just to do background noises like it's the whiskey. So he could control where he wanted them in the mix. So that's how the record you hear, Secret Agent Man, sounds like we're at the whiskey, but it was really re-recorded in the studio with a few people, a few drunk people. Uh, and, 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 but it worked. Yeah. Lou Adler knows how to do it. There's something also that's interesting about that whole period of time, and even with Trini and with Johnny Rivers, is that bands didn't go out and do a whole bunch of one-nighters. You guys would go and do a month, two months, a few weeks. We'd worked Vegas for a month. We worked Vegas in the main room at the Riviera with Nancy Wilson. Uh, Nancy Wilson. I'd sit on the side of the stage and watch her every night because her voice was truly a musical instrument. So we did, we did a lot of gigs like that. And same thing, we'd work the Playboy Club at Lake Geneva for a month. Uh, <clears throat> so A lot of long-term gigs that yeah, don't exist anymore. It makes it a little easier yeah. than, than being on an airplane every single day. Yeah. yeah. Now, the Whiskey A Go-Go was the famous club in Hollywood, but there were several of them. Mm. Huh? It was a bit of a franchise, wasn't it, at a time? Well, the, the one in L.A. was the first one and the one. But we did open one in San Francisco. We opened one in Denver. We opened one in Atlanta. And we opened one in New Orleans. And the thing about opening the club in New Orleans, it was right on Bourbon Street. We go over in the afternoon, do a sound check, get ready for opening night. They're not ready. They're not even close to being ready to open this club. They're still moving booths and chairs and tables. So opening night, the guys are in there working, hammering and getting things together. They're playing our album on the speakers out front and they're lined up down Bourbon Street thinking 
Well, the bouncers are out there. I'm sorry, full in there right now. We can't get you in. Come back tomorrow. So literally people stood out there for about five hours hoping they were going to get in. They never got in because it was just the record and <laughs> they're still building the place. They did open the next night and, and it was pretty successful. It was pretty cool. So let's cut to probably the most significant work that you did with, with Johnny Rivers and that was your USO tour. Mm. In 1966, we got approached by Johnny Grant, who was the honorary mayor of Hollywood, and they asked if we'd be willing to go do some service for our guys in Vietnam. And we said, absolutely. Uh, we're all pro-military. Those guys, whether you agree with anything politically, they're out there doing the dirty work, and the least we can do is support them. So at the last minute, about a week before we were going to go, they said, would you guys mind taking uh, uh, we, uh, this young actress, she's a singer and an actress, taking her with you to Vietnam? And it was uh, Anne Margaret. We said, eh, if we must, you know, we will. <laughs> So we rehearsed about a week, about five songs for Anne Margaret, and we head out to Vietnam. We were in Vietnam for four months, which is a long time. The first month, we were out in the South China Sea aboard the Yorktown, the Ranger, the Kitty Hawk, from carrier to carrier to carrier. So how often were you playing? About every third, fourth day. One of the things I'm, I'm really proud of, uh, Johnny Rivers and myself got the presidential award from the Vietnam Veterans of America. And we went last year to, in August to Reno, Nevada, and they presented me with my award. And I remember saying to the, we had 900 Vietnam veterans in the room. And I said, I am honored just to be in your presence and they, they loved it. Let's get to the next uh, artist that you played with. How did you get from Johnny Rivers to Bob Dylan? Bob Dylan came in the Whiskey A Go-Go and I was dating this waitress at the time and she came over to me on my break and she said, Bob Dylan's here and I went, yeah, I'm hip. She said, well, he, he wants to meet you. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm sure. So, I walked over kind of to the booth where he was sitting and I kind of walked over, had my Coke, that's all I drank Coke. And I'm checking him out and he sees me and he goes, motioned me to come here. So I go over and we sit down for a few minutes. He said, I, I really want to talk to you. He said, I want to record with you. And I said, well, yeah, I'd love to do that. He said, you're my favorite rock and roll drummer in the world and I want to record with you. And as Johnny Rivers says, praise from Caesar is praise indeed. And uh, he said, we're having a little party up in the hills in Hollywood, and I want you to come up so we can have some time together. I went, cool. And I'm not one to go to Hollywood parties. I'm really not. And uh, so I went up there, and a couple of hours went by, and I never got to talk to him. There's all these hipsters around and everything. So I finally walked over, and I said, hey, man, I'm going to split. It was good meeting you. He said, we need to talk. And I said, well, it's pretty crowded here. He said, no, come, come with me. So he took me and his best friend, a guy named Bob Newarth, and we went back in the kitchen of this house. And we started talking about everything. And he made it very clear. He wanted my address, my phone number. He wants to record with me. And so that deal's kind of locked. So a year goes by and I didn't hear from him. I'm in Detroit with Johnny Rivers. I get a call from a guy in New York named Albert Grossman. I didn't know who it was, so I didn't call back. So the next day, two, two phone calls, call Albert Grossman. I don't know who this guy is, I'm not calling him. So about the fourth day, Albert Grossman, call back operator six, which means he's paying for the call. So I thought, well, I'll call and see who this guy is. So I call, and I, lady answers the phone. She says, 
Grossman and Associates. And I said, yeah, is Al there? She said, who's calling? And I said, Mickey Jones. She said, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Don't, don't, hold on, don't go anywhere. <laughs> so Albert Grossman gets on the phone. And he says, Mickey, it's Al Grossman. I said, well, hi, Al, who, who, who are you? He said, I'm Bob Dylan's manager. I'm like, oh, okay. So he said, Bob wants to play electric. He's gonna put a band together. And the first person he's calling is you. He wants you to be his drummer. And I said, well, yeah, I'd like to talk about it. He said, well, I'm gonna have Bob call you. I said, well, look, we're closing here tomorrow night, Saturday night. I'll be home Sunday. Uh, about two in the afternoon, have him call me about three. So, okay, I have Bob, three o'clock Sunday afternoon, Bob Dylan calls on the phone. And I'm talking to him, and we're chatting, and what's the first thing a good musician asks? What does this gig pay? What does this thing gig pay? <laughs> he said, well, what I'd like to do is start you out at 750 a week. Now, that's more money than I've ever heard of. And in 66, that was large. Yeah. So I said to my wife, I said, he wants to start me out at 750 a week. And she said, look, I know you want to do it. You should take it. So I came back on the phone. I said, okay, yeah, we can work that out. They came to LA. We started rehearsing for the first electric world tour. Robbie Robertson, Garth Hudson, Rick Danko, Richard Manuel, and Mickey Jones. That was the group. And after about six weeks on the road of nothing but booze, they hated our guts. The media the next day in the paper, it would say, Bob Dylan's acoustic set was pristine and perfect. You could hear a pin drop. But when they came out with those electric guitars and drums, they, they were just, they, the band was too loud. Bob Dylan should send the band back to America. The band sucks. So after about four weeks of that, we decided to take the name The Band. So that's how we called ourselves The Band. Right. Let's play a clip here. That really was a seminal time in rock and roll history. It really did change the music and what was happening, and it really blended the folk with the rock and roll, but it was a painful transition. We were getting booed off the stage every night, but yet Rolling Stone magazine called it the greatest rock and roll tour in history. And they were making some films, doing a lot of filming and documenting it too. They were. Okay. D.A. Pinnabaker, Don Pinnabaker, he who did Don't Look Back, our film is called Eat the Document, and it's a rather Bob Dylan obtuse film. But the whole thing is, something happened when we were in Manchester, England. Somebody from the stage yelled Judas, and somebody on the stage yelled, play effing loud. I don't believe you. And for 30 years, everybody thought it was me. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. I know Bob didn't do it because I'm not much more than this from Bob. My guess is 
it's one of the roadies. We had six British roadies on tour with us, doing all the equipment, and they're standing by, they're all over the stage in case somebody needs something. And I really believe that it was one of our roadies standing up for us because we were getting booed and hated after the Judas shot. With your pencil in your hand, you see somebody naked, you say, who is that man? You try so hard, but you don't understand just what you say when you get home. How did that tour end? We came back to New York. I stayed a couple days with Barry Feinstein, who was the time life photographer on the tour. He was married to Mary Travers of Peter, Paul, and Mary. So I split, went back to LA, because we were gonna have a month off. Then we were gonna go back to New York, rehearse for one week, then we were gonna do a concert at Shea Stadium, would be Peter, Paul, and Mary doing the first half, and we would do the second half electric. And then the next day, we were going to Moscow. We were going to be the first American rock and rollers to go to Moscow. And about a week or four or five days before we were to go to New York to rehearse for Shea Stadium, Bob Dylan crashed his motorcycle in front of Albert Grossman's house at Woodstock, broke his neck. I get a call. It's Bob Dylan. He said, you don't need to come to New York Monday. And I said, no. We're not going to rehearse? He said, no, we're not going to do We canceled Shea Stadium and Moscow because I am in traction in the hospital, and I don't know when I'll play again. So, so all bets were off. But here's the stand-up guy Bob Dylan is. He paid me my salary for another year. And that's when I started working extra, trying to be an actor. And because I was getting my Bob Dylan salary, I was able to go to the bottom rung of the ladder in this business out here. But I get a call from a guy named Ken Fritz. His partner was Ken Cragen. And they had groups like, they managed the Smothers Brothers and Jennifer Warnes and John Hartford and Mason Williams and Pat Paulson. And they said, we found four singers that we have signed to a management deal, but they need a drummer. And I said, well, I'm not interested in going back out on the road. He said, would you come and at least listen to them? So I said, okay. So I go down to this little club in Huntington Beach, drive all the way to Huntington Beach, and I hear four of the purest voices I've ever heard, incredible harmony. And I went back and met him, and it was Mike Settle, Terry Williams, Thelma Camacho, and Kenny Rogers. And they were called the first edition. And they, they said, well, we'd like, could we get together with you tomorrow and jam a little bit? And I said, well, yeah, I guess we could. So I take drums over. We play for about an hour, take a break, and Mike Settle walks over. And Mike Settle is the driving force behind the group, wrote the whole first album. And Mike comes over and he says, you know we want you to be our drummer, right? I said, well, it feels pretty good. So that was the beginning of 10 years with Kenny Rogers in the first edition. So you made an interesting distinction there that's important to note, is that the name of the group was the first edition. How did it get changed into Kenny Rogers in the first edition? It's, it's actually quite a good story. 
we, we had a couple of big hit records. Just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in. But we had just come in off of a song that Mike Settle wrote called But You Know I Love You. Dolly Parton recorded a great record. And it was a big hit for us, top 10 record. We're then in the studio. Jimmy Bowen was our producer. He said, guys, we have a problem. We have about 20 minutes of studio time left. I have to deliver this album in 10 days. You're going out on the road tomorrow for six weeks, and we're one song short. Do you have anything that we could do in 20 minutes? So Kenny pops up and said, well, we, we have this, this old uh, uh, Mel Tillis song we found on a Roger Miller album, and we're doing it in the show, and it gets a great response. So he said, well, can you just run a little bit of it down for me and, and let me hear it? So I kick it off. You painted up your lips and rolled and curled your tinted hair. Well, he, we didn't even get through the first verse. He said, whoa, we're cutting that right now. <laughs> so we cut that song with one take of the instrumental track and two vocal passes. It's just on an album called the First Edition 69. It was a filler, just to fill up some space. A radio station in Boston starts playing this song, every other song. The switchboards are lit up like Christmas. Then a radio station in Denver's playing it. All these stations are calling reprise, and Mo Austin, the president, calls us in. He says, it's going crazy for this record, and we can't release two records in the same release window. So who sang lead on this? Well, that was Kenneth. So Mo said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to keep, once again, she's all alone, right where it was. We're working on it. But we're going to release Ruby under the name Kenny Rogers and the First Edition. It could have very easily been Mickey Jones and the First Edition, which I think is a lot better title. That's a, a ring better to it. ring yeah. to it. But uh, as they say, the rest is history. And uh, sometimes they'll be playing just dropped in on the radio, and they'll say, that was Kenny Rogers. I say, take another look at that label, will you? Because it just says the first edition. But that's how we accidentally became Kenny Rogers in the first edition. I remember asking you, I said, have you ever, have you ever met Elvis? You go, oh, yeah. Knew him pretty well. Yeah. I said, well, yeah. Oh, that's right. You worked the International Hotel. We opened the International in 1969, and we opened with Elvis. And we always worked with Elvis. We signed a five-year deal. We worked three months out of the year. It, it was the place in town in 69. But let me just backtrack a little. I was working extra on a movie at MGM called Speedway 66. Richard Davis, who's one of the Memphis Mafia, comes up to me and he said, E wants to meet you. I said, E? He said, yeah, he wants to meet you. I said, why? Because he wants to ask you about Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do. I end up going into his big Vogue motor home, and for about an hour, I'm sitting there chatting with Elvis, telling him about Bob Dylan. He, they said, uh, we're going to lunch. He said, come on, go to lunch with us. So I get in his Lincoln Continental Mark IV. And we drive to this little Mexican restaurant. We, we all walk in. It's, it's Elvis and the Memphis Mafia, really. Nobody else. Joe Esposito and Jerry Schilling and all his guys. And we, they go into this little back room, have our own lunch in a private room. And uh, so I actually got to know Elvis a little bit there. But when we worked Open the International, we did get to know him. That's where I met my wife. She was a 22-year-old cocktail waitress, and the first night I saw her, it was like I got hit by a train. I would go in an hour before our show, and I'd sit at this bar at the back of the showroom, and I'd have a Coke. And she'd walk by. She knew who I was because I was on the show. She'd walk by. How you doing tonight? Good. How are you? Okay. And that was our conversation for at least a week, maybe 10 days. And, and she did walk by one night. She may dispute this, but it's true. She walked by and she said, so how's it going tonight? And I said, I'm fine, how are you? She said, I'm fine, can I ask you a question? I said, absolutely, shoot. She said, so 
what's the deal? Are you going to ask me out or what? <laughs> she, she would go to the employee cafeteria, her and her girlfriend, and, and two walls of the cafeteria were glass. And they'd sit over here by this door, and they'd see Elvis coming down for the show. So they'd come out this door and meet Elvis right there so they could get a kiss from Elvis. <laughs> so my wife kissed Elvis. So I, I would like you to ask her who's better. <laughs> so 10 years with Kenny Rogers. How did that gig end? You know, uh, we, we broke the group up in January of 76. I had been telling Kenneth for over a year, he, had, he should be doing country music. That's where his forte is. And that's where he should be. I gave him my notice and I said, look, I want to get off the road. And I wanted to get into acting. And I'd already talked to my wife at lunch one day. I said, look, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. Would you be interested in possibly running away with me forever? And she said, you have to promise me one thing. She said, you have to promise me that if after a couple of years, Things aren't going the way you think they should be. You got to promise me you won't quit. And I said, you're coming with me. And, and thanks to her, I have an acting career because she worked two and three jobs the first couple of years of our life together here. And it's because of her that I was able to become an actor. When we were together with the first edition, it was me and Mickey and everybody else. He and I would get in the car and drive along, and of course Mickey would sing, which drove me crazy. You know, you can't mention his name without smiling. He just has one of those spirits that lives on. I think one of yeah. my favorite stories is we did a show called Rolling Through New Zealand. And Mickey and I went into this place in Rotorua. It has the hot chemical baths. And there's signs everywhere that say, don't stay in over 15 minutes. And we're in there, and Mickey says, ah, come on, we'll stay longer than that. We feel pretty good. So we were in there about a half hour, and we got out, and we couldn't walk. We literally were laying on the sides of that thing. So I learned not to listen to Mickey. I got the nerve, Mickey, and I took a deep breath one afternoon, and I walked up. I think their office was in the second, from the showroom here, yeah. or the room. He had an upstairs thing. And he had an office up there, uh, Paul Raffles. And man, I walked in, I said hello, and he, he was on the telephone like this, you know. And he, come on in, you know. So he finished talking about 10 minutes later, and um, uh, he says, what is it? He didn't say hello or anything. They were very rude, those Yeah, they were. Those, you know, those guys. And he says, what is it? And I said, oh, and I, I didn't know how to do it, man. I was so shy, especially in those days, and so insecure. And I finally got it out. He says, Spit it out. What is it? What is it? And I said, I, I'd like to know if I can get uh, a race. 
He says, what? <laughs> he said, what did you say? <laughs> and I said, I'd like to know if I could maybe get a raise. He says, you're fired. He said to me, and he said before I left, he said, let me ask you something. And he gave me a dirty look. He said, do you think you're making PJs or is PJs making you? And of course, I'm not going to be no dummy. And I said, well, PJs is making me. But it wasn't the truth. It's the other way around. It was the other way around. But I didn't say that. He says, you're fired. <laughs> and, I, I, and I couldn't believe it. So I went downstairs and I got my amplifier, my guitar and stuff. And I put it in my station wagon and I left. Within about a week or so, I'm at the grocery store in, in, in that area in Hollywood. It's Trini, Trini, everybody's asking for you. What happened? I said, well, they let me go. He said, oh, Trini, people are coming in, and, and they have a drink, and they said, what time does Trini Lopez go on? And they said, well, he's not here any longer. What? And said, let me have my check. And the place died until I came back because Paul Raffles called me about eight, ten days later, and he says, Trini, this is Paul Raffles. I said, oh, yeah, I knew what he, I knew what he was. <laughs> and he said, he says, we'd like to have you come back. I said, well, what about my race? He says, you got it. I said, well, what about a drummer and a bass player? He said, whatever you want. You know? Yeah, yeah. You believe so that? So that's how Nick got that's it. How, that's I, how I could afford to pay Mickey. First. I could afford, you know, to, to use Mickey.